as a developer, I choose which integration I want to work with for a certain task. But if I have multiple, like which database do I choose, right? Welcome everybody again to the Accelerometer. Today we have Tino, who is running a company called Psychic, also comes from Switzerland, uh, started the company in Zurich, I think. Very excited to have him here. Uh, there aren't many Swiss founders, so I would love to get his experience, hear a little bit more about what that was like. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Yeah, for sure. So the journey of psychic started in november last year uh, at the time it was just a couple of friends um we kind of had well we we started off like a lot of, a lot of people we wanted to start a company we had no clue what exactly we were doing um i had actually started a company before um so we had uh, we had an idea of kind of the the broad strategy i guess we wanted to follow um, but we didn't really know what we wanted to build uh, so we spent a lot of time uh, ideating about different topics that we're actually good at and ended up at consulting, uh, ultimately, at least the consulting industry. Um, long story short, um, we came to Berkeley uh, because one of my co-founders was still doing their master's there. Um, through the university, got in contact with Skydeck, which is an accelerator program here. Um, uh, got into uh, Skydeck, uh, founded the company, uh, started building the first versions of our product, failed miserably <laughs> a couple of times along the way. Um, um, and then finally, a couple months ago, found the use case that we're actually sticking to um, and been building ever since. Got our first customers um, and are now in the seed stage of fundraising. That's really exciting. What's the What's the use case that you're sticking to? Yeah, so um, we looked at the consulting, management consulting industry as a whole, um, yeah. and based on our past experiences in this space, and a lot of our friends are consultants, we, uh, we realized that the core of what management consultants do is solving complex problems and coming up with creative solutions, and that's really cool. But yeah. unfortunately, to get there, you actually spend a lot of time on data analysis using Excel sheets and going through, um, repeatedly going through um, reports, um, interviews, survey data, and the likes. And that just takes a ton of time. It's not very hard, uh, and it's also not very fun. So we built a tool that analyzes survey data and expert interview data and consolidates that into uh, reports. And these reports are then used in, uh, for example, commercial due diligence, but also other projects like transition implementation, restructuring, etc. So we help a lot with preparing the management consultants to actually be ready to come up with complex problems uh, and solutions uh, rather than having to do a lot of the pre-work for that themselves. I've never worked with a management consultant. Can you tell me a little bit, like, can you give me an example of one of the complex problems that a management consultant would solve well let's start with uh with one of the use cases our client is using us right now for yeah. um it's called commercial due diligence if you're not familiar commercial due diligence happens in any larger m a transaction it's a process What's that m a transaction uh, sorry an m a transaction like a merger and acquisition so when okay. a, a big company comes uh buys uh usually a smaller company or a similar yeah. size company um, there's a lot of due diligence that you do because you want to figure out or is the company that you're buying actually what they claim to be. Yeah. Now, if this is a larger transaction, you would usually hire um, a team of consultants to actually go through all of the data in this organization to make yeah. sure like they are what they claim. Um, now, commercial due diligence is a subset of due diligence um, that uh, typically involves a lot of qualitative data. So it's usually talking to expert interview uh, experts in the industry, uh, interviewing them about things like, um, well, where is the market heading? Um, what are the trends in the industry? But at the same time, you also talk to a lot of employees of the company that's being acquired uh, to kind of understand what are the cost centers, who's in charge of what, um, how do the operations look in this organization? 
Um, because it's an M&A transaction, uh, this process only can last two to three weeks um, because that's the no shop time of an M&A transaction. No shop time um, is basically just Very the quick. time. Yeah, no shop. Yeah, it's pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, it, so it's basically there's a time where um, the seller of the organization is not allowed to take other offers from buyer. So in that yeah. time, you have to make your buying decision. And that kind of is why these projects have to happen so quickly. So as you yeah. can imagine, you do all these interviews with these experts, you do surveys with the company's clients to understand if they're happy or not with the product. And then you have to analyze all of this data and put it into a report. And that takes you a lot of time because it's unstructured text data. Yeah. Um, and large language models are actually uniquely positioned well to solve this problem because you have a very structured process. Uh, you have a lot of qualitative data. Yeah. And you have a predefined output, which is this survey report. So that means you can use this technology while still providing the guardrails to make sure that sure. the output you provide is actually what you expect. What sort of what sort of things prevent these transactions, these mergers from actually going through? I mean, there's a there's a lot of things yeah. that that can happen. Um, Often it's just basically the, the, the strategy team um, may look at the market, um, do these expert interviews and realize actually this is not, the market is not developing uh, yeah. the way we hoped it would uh, and you decide to pass on the buying decision. Yeah. Um, but more often than not, like a lot of this pre-work has already been done and the due diligence is more of a formality. So if you don't really find anything along the way, that's a really big red flag, it would typically go through. Would you say that your software helps find these red flags? To a certain extent. Um, yeah. I mean, right now we don't, we don't want, we won't replace uh, commercial due diligence consultants completely. Yeah. And I don't think it's responsible to just let a large language model kind of so uh, you surface them. Take. The, yeah, the flags, right? exactly. You surface them, right? Yeah. Like, uh, our job is to point the consultant in the right direction yeah to basically show hey look here's the data these are the correlations that seem non-obvious or seem interesting and here's where you should dig deeper and then for the obvious stuff obviously you don't have to focus so much on it because we've already consolidated that into a report for you so when you guys were working as consultants were you working as a consultant i was i was i was working uh, back in back in a past life i was working as a financial due diligence consultant okay so th this hits home for you like this is a problem that you specifically yeah I, s I spent a lot of hours um going through excel sheets copying pasting data from various annual reports kind of trying to build my own workflows uh, for everything to match and for every project i would do more or less the same thing over and over again which yeah. is why we came to the idea to automate this because we're like okay look although every company is different uh, if you abstract away from it the process of how you go about it there's a playbook uh, and we can follow this playbook and we can actually build a system that follows this playbook and makes sure that the um, technology we're using um, remains within the scope of this playbook and doesn't completely go off the rails. Yeah. Um, so for us, uh, it makes a lot of sense to stick with these well-structured projects for now. You you weren't doing mergers and acquisitions, but then yeah. uh, you you went into M and A after. How did you make that decision? Yeah. So I personally actually didn't go into M and A. I went into venture capital after um, really? uh, for a little bit. Uh, which also actually also uh, requires a lot of um, due diligence. So then I got to ask, what's my mode? My mode? <laughs> what's my mode? That's, that's yeah. always what you ask, right? If you're a VC, every time you sit in uh, an interview, what's, it's what's, like, yeah, what's yeah. your mode? <laughs> what, <laughs> what's our mode? Yeah. Tell me, what is my mode? Um, yeah, this is, this is a great question. We're still working on that. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, you've got a moat. Huh? You've already built your moat. No, look, we we haven't we haven't built our moat. Uh, yeah. I think we're we're too early um, to to have a a, a really defensible moat. To build your moat. Um, around three million dollars in the next eighteen months. Okay, so you've hired some <laughs> contractors. You got them to prospect the site. You know, there are no large rocks underneath where you're going to be building the moat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, three million is quite a bit to build a moat with. You know. You expect like that's like nuclear powered moat. Yeah, yeah. No, um, our uh, our our core thesis uh, is that uh, for any 
AI startup out there and that's an application layer where it works on the application side of things i think ui and ux is going to be the only real differentiator like ultimately the models out there right now everybody's more or less using the same ones um of course you can fine tune and build your own data set to a certain extent but with what we've seen with the developments of in generative ai recently um it's hard to predict whether or not like that's really defensible in the long run or whether models are just going to get so good that the fine tuning itself won't make a huge difference yeah um we believe uh right now um you can differentiate if you manage to build a workflow uh around the specific use case that fits the uh, existing work that in our yeah. case consultants do very very closely um and that's actually what we've done uh, it hasn't cost us <laughs> a lot of money so yeah. far um but to actually make this a uh, defensible large business we have to do build this workflow that we've built we have to repeat this in many other projects across the consulting industry and yeah. for us the biggest risk is that we don't make this jump from say commercial due diligence uh into transition implementation projects um and that's still going to require uh, a lot of exploration and a lot of um interacting with these consultants to actually yeah. build something that holds how how are you going about doing that exploration yeah so um originally we started um with just interviews um i think at this point we probably interviewed over 200 consultants from you know, from all the way from partners at McKinsey to freelancers um, kind of doing their own um, management consulting firm. These are usually ex-consultants that just realize they get paid more if they don't work for a firm, but they just offer the services directly. Um, but now we've kind of transitioned to um, design partnerships and paid pilot projects. Yeah. Um, this is one on the one side. Um, we realize people are a lot more committed to work with us if they're actually paying us money because th yeah. it, it's weird because like we don't we don't care about the revenue in this stage like what we care about is having someone that's committed to working with us because yeah. that way we can get a lot more insights about their processes and workflows and actually build something that works with them um, but if we offer it for free we realize people just don't put effort into it so but as soon as we charge them they're actually more willing to work with us so we're like okay we'll take your money but like please also spend time with us um yeah. so now with every client we have um we hold a two or three hour workshop every week um we try to release um newer updates uh, and versions of the product every week as well uh, and the core of all of this uh, is really understanding how they use it um, because again like building something that fits existing workflows uh is the only way i think you can differentiate yourself in today's environment in the short run uh, in the yeah. long run it's a different story but uh, in the short run for us i think that's that's what makes a difference so where did you find your first your your 200 consultants to interview oh man i mean uh, a, a lot of places so uh obviously linkedin is a great source and yeah. um, we did a lot of outreach on LinkedIn, um, yeah. obviously coming from a consulting background and I've been to business yeah. school. So uh, we have a lot of friends uh, in the consulting industry. Yeah. Uh, so initially that was very easy. Um, we also started building uh, a newsletter. Um, uh, you can find it on sidekick.ai yeah. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in following us. Um, so we've through that, we've been able to generate a lot of interviews as well um yeah um and now like as we've gotten more more mature i think we started we started really i mean at the beginning it was just you know random messaging people and now yeah. like we have like proper outreach campaigns on linkedin and these seem to still work surprisingly well you ever do any uh, like cold calling yeah we've done <laughs> some cold calling it's a miserable miserable experience it was a miserable experience um, what happened i mean usually you you uh you get to voicemail yeah um uh and then they never call you back but yeah. then you still have to it's not scalable like, right hello i am a robot <laughs> <laughs> please pick up the phone for yeah. my sales call <laughs> i mean it's it's not it's not like a really scalable way to reach out because every time yeah. you still have to pick up the phone you have to dial the phone number it usually takes you two or three tries to get the right one 
and then no yeah. one picks up and then you leave your voice message and then out of i don't know 20 30 companies if yeah. you're like lucky three or four get back which is still a 10 percent conversion rate which is not horrible but at the same time it's as i said like right now everything is is e email campaigns and linkedin campaigns and uh, it's working it's working fairly well for us uh, yeah. and at this point actually the, and i guess it's it's a bit of a luxury problem uh, in a sense but like we have enough uh, we have enough like um uh, clients in the pipeline uh, we have enough pilots on board um that we we're actually kind of at capacity we can't serve more people than we have right now yeah um so we're not putting a lot of effort uh into into outreach right now yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean it's lucky i guess yeah <laughs> that is definitely a champagne problem yeah i mean it's not gonna stay like this but like right now we're riding that high <laughs> yeah what is something that's been particularly hard for you so it was i guess one of the hardest things for us and, and that's gonna sound really 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 stupid but it's it's actually figuring out what we wanted to do yeah um we so many times we thought we had a really good idea um we built the first version of a product we were super excited for it people told us yeah we definitely want to use this uh and then you try to sell it and nobody wants to buy it and you yeah. put it on there for fr you put it out there for free and still nobody uses it and that's that's kind of devastating and it's it's devastating if you do it like three four five times in a row and at some point you're just like you're kind of you're kind of over it you're like you know what like i don't know maybe maybe people just don't get me or i don't get people but like what whatever whatever we're doing is not working um yeah. um so all, all the more it's been super rewarding when you actually find something that people want um, but i guess like this yeah this initial pro process um and i mean it's an ongoing process right but i feel like once you actually feel the traction for the first time you've kind of proven yourself that you can do it and it's it's easier after that even even if now like still we do stuff that fails people don't want um that's okay because like yeah. we know if we do it enough we'll get back to what people actually want what makes yeah. that so difficult um <laughs> i mean i guess the fear that yeah. you're kind of wasting your life yeah you know your does that, does that go away though no i still have it i yeah. still have it you'll have like, paying customers you'll be like you'll make 10 million a year and i feel like you'll still have that yeah yeah no it's fair it's fair it's it's like i don't know i always i always like picture myself becoming like a, a startup coach startup coach and that's like really not where i want to be <laughs> this is like your <laughs> failure plan becoming a startup coach yeah like i, I don't want to like i don't want to be like too negative too negative about it but I I, yeah. I I i do i do feel like i've i've met a lot of people um uh, that just don't really know what to do anymore and then they're yeah. just they they become a coach and it's sometimes i get like i don't want to generalize like i'm sure there's people out there that can add a lot of value um yeah. but a lot of the people i've met also just don't add a lot of value um, yeah. uh, and like i don't want to become that person you know like that's yeah. like yeah i've been trying to build a startup for the fourth time now never worked out um but here let me let me share my advice like there's always some learnings along the way but ah, i don't know did you did you feel that fear of like being unsure like you were unsure you were on the right path while you were working as a consultant I guess not so much because mm -hmm. I always felt I always knew that this was kind of a temporary, temporary thing. Yeah. Um, so uh, this feels permanent. This feels very permanent. Yeah. I, I as a as a consultant. It's um, somehow both permanent and you're not sure that it's the right thing to do. <laughs> I yeah. I love that. Yeah. No, but it, it, it is right. Because yeah. it's, it's like you're like, OK, I'm going to I'm committing to this now. Like yeah. I'm. I'm committing to uh I just worked uh for an entire year without salary yeah. um pretty much and I'm committing to doing that if it has to happen uh for 5 year 5 more years. Yeah. And I'm doing this all on a statistically speaking 1 to 2% chance uh that my company might hit a series A 
and i might yeah. be able to pay myself a salary like not even get rich you know like just like yeah. have a, have like a um a living life and that that just sounds like not a wise financial decision yeah you know <laughs> like, yeah like it just seems it just seems super risky um a lot can go wrong um but for somehow some reason i still can't not do it um yeah uh, and that sometimes stresses me out a bit yeah, yeah. like I'm, I'm gonna be honest like sometimes um i wake up and you know you have like your friends um that uh, actually one of one of our first uh one of our my initial initial co-founders um uh, he he left and went to work for mckinsey yeah and i'm like good how was on you with that <laughs> huh how was dealing with losing a co-founder oh that was a rough time yeah that was a rough time i mean he was a really he, he was more than a co-founder he's a really really good friend uh, yeah not i don't want to say what still is um <laughs> Hi, I, mean, I mean a lot um, <laughs> you leave the startup life that's it yeah yeah it's like nah man you sorry <laughs> you, yeah. you really messed up yeah. um no i mean that was that was hard on all of us like we talked about it uh, a lot um uh, uh, i think for him uh at the time it was it was the right decision and um uh we we obviously gave him as much support as we could and he still supports us as much as he can so like it's yeah. it's great like everybody loves everyone but then still like it still happened you know like yeah. you're um uh, so obviously I that mean, was love, a rough love can't rough isn't patch. enough to keep you like building a sort of yeah yeah it's, it's a lot of work yeah it's, 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 a, it's a lot of Good work friend relationship that's all you need to build a startup yeah yeah i mean honestly i think that that is that is an important part of it um yeah i mean uh, just having a team that has has your back and like yeah. you have to really like the people around you i mean we've been uh, my co-founder and i we've been living in the same house for like eight months now we've only usually had two rooms and one sofa so there's like Whoa. yeah wow. th there's no privacy and yeah. you live together you work together and you know how it is you don't do much else right so yeah. every time you You're wake up gym. Yeah, you go to the gym with yeah. your co-founders. <laughs> yeah. You eat dinner with your co-founders and you go to work and you go to sleep. Yeah, that's intense. Ten, you, ten you have to have you have to have a good team. I think that's yeah. that's the biggest no, yeah. What one gave of the biggest the conviction part. that like the co-founders that were for all of you guys like that you, you this was real that like you were ready to move to San Francisco. Was it getting that first customer? um no we came here way before our first customer um yeah. uh we've known each other for s over six years yeah um, I mean, i've known people for 12 years that i haven't built startups with them yeah that's that's true but like yeah. over those six years we we've worked together um we've studied together we knew we worked together we we trust the the work we do with each other a lot yeah. um and we've been talking about starting a company um for probably like four or five years at this point and then at some point uh, at the end of last year the timing just aligned for the first time yeah. all of us were in a position where we're like i could start something new now and it could be a job or we could just build this uh, and yeah that was the first time we all had we all had that time on our hands and yeah it just made sense it was never a question i don't know we never we never really decided should we do this or not um it was it was kind of obvious when we had when when everything lined up we're like yeah we're just gonna do we it are doing we'll this. figure it out yeah we'll figure it out along the line and we're still figuring out how did you decide uh, who had what role it, it kind of naturally happened you know yeah. like we didn't sa sit down together on the first day and we're like these these are the roles that we have yeah um uh but um richard had the most tech experience from any uh from any yeah. of us like he was he was uh, the in charge of building or like deciding how we build, not necessarily what, but how we build and yeah. where and when. Um, so he took on that role of leading the technical part uh, fairly early on. Yeah. Um, and then Nuno and I um, kind of just went uh, in into I guess a bit different directions. Like Nuno just completely uh, ingested the core of customer exploration and how to do it and he got really 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 good at it yeah um 
uh, and he's also he has a quite quite a hand uh, w- with designing stuff. And yeah. then my background um, was uh, was I've worked I've been uh, a co-founder of a startup before. I've seen seen a little bit of the startup world. Like I've gone through this process. I've fundraised before. Like um, and for for that reason, I guess I had a bit of an idea of what was coming and. I think like I am I was able um uh to like at, at least at the beginning to kind of give give a little bit of comfort that like we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. And that that put me in a position where I was kind of managing um uh, managing at least like parts of the strategy. Um but you know like we still we still like we're all uh, we consider ourselves very equal we have a very flat hierarchy it's uh, we we yeah. vote we vote on things we just we take decisions together yeah um does that ever cause problems um i mean sometimes i guess you have three people so <laughs> yeah i mean we have three people that uh, there are no stalemates yeah in, in that sense in that sense yeah. uh, um it, it makes sense but yeah i mean obviously you know sometimes you um you don't agree um yeah. And then someone has to uh, take a decision, or you vote, and then not everyone is always happy with that. But you yeah. learn to you learn to deal with it. At the same time, um, obviously, sometimes you um, you maybe discuss things that don't need to be discussed too much, or um, other times, I mean, yeah, you uh, you feel like you have to move forward, and you don't discuss something that you should have discussed, and then. Uh, then that backfires as well because then everybody's like, well, why didn't we discuss this? So like finding that yeah. balance is, is really hard sometimes. Um, but I think as a team, we, we, we do all agree that typically when, uh, when we work on, when we work on something together and we take decisions as a team, the, the output uh, is generally better than if yeah. one of us does it alone. That's why we do it as much as possible. What's the biggest technical challenge you guys have had working with AI? We're building, as I said, like we're we're working on an application layer, so yeah. we're using a lot of stuff that's already out there. Um, but then, because everything's so early, um, nothing's documented. Um, so just at the begin, I mean, now it's a b- bit different. But at the beginning, it was just like even just figuring out like how to use things like I don't know, Llama Index or or yeah. Langchain, um, and actually get it to do what you want to do um, was uh, was tough. Um, now our biggest challenge that we're facing uh is probably something that a lot of people face is, is the the data pipeline like yeah we we deal with a lot of unstructured um data it comes from various sources often excel sheets every excel sheet is organized differently um and how do you build a system that can ingest all of these different excel sheets uh and and um documents uh, that ha- all have their own separate structure and put it in a somewhat standardized format what pieces of technology or what lo- ideas are you excited about in the future um i mean generally i'm i'm like curious where uh where large language models are going to go like i'm super excited uh about open ai just recently uh releasing like uh, the vision aspect yeah. of things like obviously um they will be good at OCR, but uh, at the same time, for us, this is, you know, this is, again, it's like, what, can we now look at an Excel sheet and understand its structure? You know, like, yeah. uh, these are the types of things where I, I have no idea uh, about yeah. how capable uh, this these models are right now. Um, yeah. Uh, we haven't tested, uh, tested the newest release yet, but I'm really excited to see where that goes. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, overall, like, I'm just excited about integrations um, with uh, large language models, um, like G- obviously the the plugins into ChatGPT were already a game changer. I'm sure like you've used things like Code Interpreter, yeah. Uh, and suddenly you have you have uh, a chatbot that is not you know just answering questions, which gets a bit old fairly quick. But now suddenly you have something that can interact with a lot of different technologies across uh different levels uh of interaction and that's also ultimately what we're working on right like when i I talked a lot about automating workflows um 
and being able being able to build integrations uh, and give give certain autonomy to systems uh, like this um, is super interesting a little bit scary because yeah but like super interesting i mean it, it's you can the, I, i'm really excited about like all the all the possibilities that yeah. nobody's c come up with so far like i'm sure there's going to be some mind-blowing stuff happening in the next five to ten years in what way is it scary i think it's scary because the i mean the technology is maybe it's new it's maybe not as new as as it, it's obviously not like, like a, a year old, old. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it's been around for a bit longer than a yeah. year, but, like, it, it's gained public recognition for a year, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which means, like, it's it's too young to have, like, proper testing on it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of parts where people don't really know what's going on. There are, like, probably a few select people that really, in the world, that really understand, like, the deep inner workings of these models, and everybody else is like, ooh, nice input, ah. Yeah. And it did something creative. And now, if you give that, if you give that access to things like, uh, somebody like your bank account, and it can start doing, I don't know, purchasing decisions, yeah. um, like, what happens? Like, how does advertising change, for example? Are we, are advertisers going to start, you know, um, advertising towards large language models imagine like i build a product uh, and that product uh, is able uh, has a l has a large language model i'm using an agent and i'm able to uh, that agent is able to um, build integrations to i don't know different products themselves yeah uh, and it can decide which product to use so are you now advertising to the agent or to the end user if the large language model is taking the decision on which product to use for a sp yeah. certain job um or then obviously like if you go more into like the 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 political um aspect of things like i think sam altman was quoted saying uh i think it was a couple of months back basically he wants to go into a direction where everybody on their own device has their own personalized large language model yeah and like now wh what does that look like is this going to be like the social media echo chamber on steroids you know like do you get yeah. your own feedback of what you want to hear um and who's controlling um to what extent um this yeah. is still okay right like uh, what if you have very slightly skewed world views and uh your personal ai just <laughs> enforces those to an extent where everything yeah. becomes super polarized um yeah i think those those are those are think i think questions yet to still be answered yeah um i'm really yeah. intrigued by this idea of advertising to the large language model the implication there is of course you know somebody's going to come out and create a marketing agency designed yeah. <laughs> for large yeah. language models yeah and i i think that that's a that's like a realistic possibility yeah um it's actually a, a, a thought of uh, a thought of a friend that 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 brought this to me and i was like yeah it was pretty mind-blowing i was like yeah you're right like yeah as a developer i choose which integration i want to work with for a certain task but if i have multiple like which database do i choose right yeah and, like there's multiple out there but now if i'm giving that freedom to a large language model what's it going to choose and how do i advertise to that <laughs> it's, it's yeah. just it's interesting on that wonderful note, thank you so much for coming on the Accelerometer.